Good afternoon to all and welcome to our next session, um, the final session for today of the, the Symposium on Ancient Greece. Uh, it's been a pleasure um, hosting this series over the month of October and we continue until November the 7th and you have your programs here. I hope you will check the listing. Tomorrow we go from uh, early morning to late at night and so there are several topics to be presented there. There are films and other programs uh, coming up very soon and uh, next week there are several other uh, activities including uh, the finale of the entire symposium will take place in the McAfee North Gym where you will have um, instrumental accompaniment and dance by students from your college and um, a presentation by a professor from your college. And so I, I'm hoping that you all want to, uh, or that will pique your interest to uh, make sure you're, that you're there for that one. But um, nonetheless, w in this program, we are uh, trying to present various aspects of civilization in ancient Greece and trying to pique people's interest in looking towards study abroad, there or anywhere else, because as you can see, just looking at the top line of this, we have some things to learn uh, that uh, might not happen in our daily life, but um, are occurring right now across the world in various forms. And so in, in order to open our minds and um, ideas to uh, new things, we, we have this series. So uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, Dr. Wafik Wabi from the School of Technology to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Now, Wafik Wabi would be old news now because you know me. The meaning of my name could be a successful man or a peaceful person or a friend or a companion or a negotiator for peace or mediator or something like that. Ask my parents why they chose this name for me. It's challenging to live up to it, but that's my name, Wafik. Now, if you can read the top word here, go to your professors and say, give me an A. Who can read this for us? Okay, if you can't read it, we'll ask our presenter, distinguished speaker, to tell us more about it, not just pronounce it, but tell us about it. Before I introduce him, I mean, I have a lot to say about him, maybe two hours to introduce him. <laughs> <laughs> you get your bachelor, and you run yeah. to whatever. Rarely you go to get a master's, and another master's, and a PhD, and you become a professor, and guess what after this? maybe 10, 20 years of teaching or 25, he enrolls in a class to sit as a student getting a master's in technology. And that's how I came to know him. He said, Dr. Wabi, may I enroll in your class? I told him, Dr. Albert, this is another story. <laughs> and as, as the days went by, I discovered lots of uh, multifaceted things in him, in even in what you call this thing that you do. Karate. Karate or something. <laughs> well, uh, the best way to introduce him is to ask his chair to introduce him. And to introduce the chair, you ask the assistant dean to introduce him. And to introduce him, <laughs> you ask the dean to come. Okay. So we've got the dean here. Imagine how the dean is here. Would you please introduce him? And don't forget <laughs> to say hi to Miss Albert here. Mrs. Albert, thank you for coming for this. So. Well, it's really nice to be here. Um, like I said, I'll see all of you at graduation, but we're here for another reason today. And I think when you start looking at different cultures, it really makes you understand how come we have certain things in our country that we have. And I think during the course of what Dr. Albert is gonna speak to you about today, you may start making some of those connections. And that's what we really hope that you do, is connect what you hear today with what you're seeing going on in the world right now. Um, those of you in kinesiology and sports studies, I'm going to expect a mandatory attendance at the fun finale because <laughs> Dr. Ronspies will want you there and so will Dr. Owen. And we do have a good time at that. There will be music, there will be dance, there will be information presented. Um, and I might have to take role there too, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but that's not really why I'm here. I'm here to really introduce um, Dr. Lucas. I'll introduce, it. you met Dr. Bauer, he is the Associate Dean. Some of you in teacher ed probably have seen him quite a bit probably from the time that you came to an open house to the time that you uh, came to prowl visits when you saw us. But you got to see a lot of us. 
But Dr. Lucas is a person, and I'm going to let him start moseying up here. Dr. Lewis is the chair of Secondary Education and Foundation. He has been at Eastern as long as I have. I don't think you got here before me, did you? We started the same day, July 1st in 2006. Um, hmm? Nice glasses. Um, wow. Actually, it was 7.30 a.m., and Buzzard Hall had no power that day. I started my first day of work with no power. No, not really, not really. But anyway, um, Dr. Lucas has been here. He has done a variety of things. Um, those of you that are interested in some uh, large research projects, he is the uh, director of our teacher graduate assessment survey, where we, those of you that go into teaching after you leave here into, as your career, about a year after you go out there uh, and are in the field, you're going to get a um, postcard, I think. It's a letter. Okay, we send a real letter. Okay, I thought it was a postcard. Uh, and it's going to ask you to go online and take a survey. And we really do hope you do this because this is information that's important for us to know as we plan and revise programs, which we do on a yearly basis. Uh, those of you in kinesiology and sports studies, you will get information requests from your department periodically as well, asking for information on the program. Those of you in, I heard art, I heard what was the other, history and some other majors, your departments will do that. Please take the time to give us uh, answers to the questions that we ask you. We actually read them. Believe it or not, we read them. We use that information as we revise programs, and I encourage you to be an active participant. Eastern is known for that, and we end up with, uh, instead of having maybe a 35% rate of uh, returns on surveys, we actually get close to 60% of a return rate for us, which is phenomenal. So it's because of you taking the time to do that because you know that we're going to listen to it. So I encourage you to do that. Dr. Lucas is in charge of that whole project for all 12 public institutions in the state of Illinois. So uh, he's used to working with large databases. So those of you that like research and like to think about that, I'd encourage you to talk to him. And with that, I'm going to let him introduce Dr. Albert so we can get on with the speech. Thanks, Dr. Jack. Well, welcome students and community guests and, and folks from, from Eastern. Um, it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Um, Gus Albert, who is a member of the Department of Secondary Education and Foundations. He's been here eight years. Uh, he came here originally uh, as an advisor in the Gateway Program here on campus. Uh, prior to being uh, coming to Eastern, he taught at multiple levels of um, kindergarten through 12th grade schools in Illinois and held management and training positions with uh, a number of Fortune 500 companies. Uh, he received his Ph.D. with honors in curriculum and instruction from Indiana State University, an M.A. with honors in educational administration from St. Xavier University, a B.A. in liberal arts from Western Illinois University, and an E.D.S. from Eastern in educational administration. He is a certified lawyer's assistant with a specialization in legal research and litigation and is currently pursuing an MS in technology here at Eastern. So, Dr. Albier, where'd you, there you are. I'm right here. Welcome, we're glad to have you. Thank you, Dr. Today. Lucas, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we're in a library, so I brought books. Three books to be specific. Uh, the books that we're gonna talk about today, or at least the concepts that are in the books that we're gonna talk about today, because these three books are, uh, the core of the ideals of Greek culture relative to education, not just in the United States, but throughout most of what we are going to be calling, or what Dr. Yeager, the, f the man you're going to see in a second on the, on the PowerPoint, called the Hellenization of the Western world. Now, uh, I'll pass them around and you can see them, because it's, it's very important not just that you see them, but that you see what I did to them, okay? Because one of the things that uh, is important relative to what we're doing is understanding from an educational perspective what you must do in relation to having a relationship with your books. Uh, part of that comes from a concept uh, from the Middle Ages, which originated, of course, in the Greek period, the Hellenistic period, which is the period um, that we're looking at from, let's say, the end of the Roman Republic all the way through uh, Mm, to the time that uh, Alexander the Great conquered the world. The period immediately after that becomes Hellenistic, and prior to that is Hellenic. Okay? We're going to be starting this because this goes before that. 
this goes into a period uh, that starts off with what we call the Mycenaean Age or the Homeric Age, the age in which Homer becomes the main educator uh, to what was then known as the known world. And paideia is important. That's what the Greek letters united together up there mean. Uh, pi, alpha, uh, you know, it just, if, you, if you're in a sorority or a fraternity, you know that that's paideia. If not, um, well, um, I'll help you with that, okay? But um, what, what, the, what the discussion today is, the symposium today is about, is the concept of education as cultural development of a nation's spiritual life. And this is very important to me because I became an American citizen, oh, when I was a very young man. I came here from a foreign country and studied very hard and spent a lot of time learning everything that I needed to learn relative to being a responsible citizen of the United States. And I found it shocking a lot of times that we as Americans really did not know what our culture was. Um, until Adam Smith decided to tell us that it was based on the acquisition of revenues and capital, we basically believed for the first 140 years or so of our existence here in the United States, and I mean 1636 to 1776, approximately 140 years, that our functional goal in education was the development of a spiritual life, but the definition of that spiritual life became religious instead of spiritual, and there is a difference. Um, in 1636, Harvard opened its doors, and in 1776, we had a revolution. At that time period in between, built higher education in the United States through what's known as the Nine Brothers and later on the Seven Sisters. Now, the Nine Brothers are the nine founding colleges of the United States, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, University of Pennsylvania, et cetera, Dartmouth, uh, nine basic ones on the eastern seaboard. And in those nine colleges, the spiritual life that was being developed uh, was religious, as I stated, but it was religious from the perspective of differentiation between ideologies. Harvard is founded on a boat, not on land. The boat was known as the Arbella, and in that boat, as it came across with the Puritans, not the Pilgrims, what was written was something called the Arbella Compact, in which we find that one of the main concepts inside that is that they needed to build a school in what they call the city upon the hill. Does anybody know what the city upon the hill is? It's Boston. It's Boston. And, and when they finished writing the Arbella Compact on the Arbella, on the boat, they made sure that they found a section of the area that they were going to build that city on to build the school for the purpose of generating ministers for their conceptualization of the Protestant faith that they followed, which they considered pure. Now, that means that Harvard was a religious school. Okay? Every other school that branched off of it, second one, you know, William and Mary, and then Yale, etc., became different sectors of the idea of Puritanism. Uh, Congregationalism, Episcopalians, it just continued on. Now the interesting factor, and then I'm going to get into why this is important from a cultural perspective relative to the ancient Greeks. Uh, the, a religious, a religious uh, something for when you play your game of Trivial Pursuit is that the majority, the majority, with maybe two or three exceptions of the founding fathers of the United States went to the Nine Brothers. The exceptions being Benjamin Franklin, John Henry, you know, and one other that escapes my memory because I'm getting my Alzheimer's kick right now. So the most important thing to note is that when we founded the United States, well, let me take it back. When the colony of England that was founded in the Americas, in the North Americas, generated this first schooling concepts, it based it upon religious education, but not just religious education. They based it on something we call theocracy. Theos means God in Greek, and kratia it means the, a, a system of control or government associated with, this, with, with the prefix, theos. Uh, so what did they need to do? Well, they needed not just to build ministers to interpret the faith of the Bible in their perspective, but they also needed administrators to run the cities in which they would continue to expand through the evangelical concept that was inherent within their faith. 
Now, evangelism means that they had what is called, uh, especially by Dr. Perry, where it's a really good book. I'll, I'll show it to you sometime after the, we finish our discussion. Uh, an errand into the wilderness. And that errand was based on going out and convincing the majority of the indigenous population, you know, that Christianity was what they should follow. So you needed an administrative structure for the villages that they were going to build, and you needed uh, ministers of their perception of faith to go out and evangelize the indigenous populations of America. That was the basic principle of the foundation of Harvard and the, every other one of the nine brothers as they continued to expand. But in 1776, something strange happens, right? We, we revolt against England and we become an independent nation, right? We become we the people. And that is really, really different because what occurs then is that the type of education that hits America begins to shift from the classical traditions to a more modern perspective. And of course, the, the person that we must focus on at the time relative to this is Thomas Jefferson because he is the man who decides that we must modernize educational systems. He builds the University of Virginia. He even generates the architecture to the T where uh, a fun and interesting thing, if you take a look at the architectural maps that are uh, available of how he generated the University of Virginia, you'll find that he has set up what can only be des described as uh, uh, natural air conditioning. Uh, the way that the school is positioned uh, relative to prevailing winds and certain uh, ducts that he built into this U-shaped university uh, allowed the air to circulate to the point where the hot air that was above would dissipate out the windows and cool air would be maintained throughout the hot summer days. He also set it up uh, as, a, as a system where the teachers and the students would either live close to each other in proximity or have constant cultural relationships and social relationships amongst each other. But what was central, what was central to this concept, which was a little different than the other schools is, and I think that Dean Lanham will appreciate this, the library was the central depository of knowledge. And you could not have a school, a college, a university, if you did not have the books. Because the books is what they went to in order to be able to learn the material that was being asked by the professor to be read by the students so that they could do the first definitional construct of the day, logos. I'm sorry, the second one. The first one was paideia. And logos, ladies and gentlemen, is the methodology of discursive knowledge, which means that we must talk about, we must talk about what we are learning in order to be able to clarify our understanding of what we thought we were learning. And I said, thought we were learning because only after you do this discursive practice can you clean away the debris and centralize your mind in an understanding of a definition in itself in action. Now, what I'm doing is, is, is just what a typical philosopher does. I'm giving you a way to understand definitional constructs before I start. Because if I don't tell you what the definitions are, considering we're already beginning to speak ancient Greek, and at the same time we're discussing in colloquial American English, I have to make sure you have an idea of what these definitions are. So logos is discursive practice to try to clarify knowledge, which means we have to talk about it. It's how we talk about it that makes us akin to what the Greeks did and does not deny the shift in education that happened post-1776. At the same time, it emphasizes the critical thinking perspectives that were indigenous to the Greek mentality which Hellenized the world of the West. And I emphasize this because when you take a look at how education occurs in the East, it is a completely different uh, world of being, if you will, relative to education. Eastern students, students from the uh, non-Western countries, which really makes a division at the Bosphorus Straits, okay? At the Bosphorus Straits between uh, where Istanbul is or what used to be Constantinople and the rest of the world, the moment that you cross that, you have a completely different perspective on how to treat education, how to understand, how to learn, how to teach, and how to think. It's completely different. Whenever I have my students in class, I ask them three basic questions pretty close to the first day of class. I said, are you planning on being a teacher? And most of them are there because that's what they're planning on being. I said, okay, that means that when you get out, 
when you go through commencement, the beginning of your life, not the end of your career, which is interesting as it is, but we're not dealing with Latin today, just Greek, that you're going to be able to step into a classroom and have a strong understanding of three power words. You're going to know what it means to learn, and you'll be able to define it. You're going to know what it means to teach, and you'll be able to define it. And you're going to be able to tell me what it is to know, to learn, to teach, and to know. Because from those three perspectives, united together, what you drive out of those three perspectives is paideia, the cultural development of what the society that you live in thinks should be as an educational construct within its citoyens, as the French say, or citizens, as we say. Okay? So what I'm telling you is that the definitions associated with what we're going to be discussing okay, can be divided into three perspectives. This is Israel Scheffler out of Harvard University. Three perspectives. Okay? A stipulative perspective. This thing works here, this thing works now, but it does not work in any other time but here and now. It's stipulated to time and place. Social, culturally stipulated. Const second one, okay? Second definitional construct is going to be a productive one, but it's going to be productive in the fact that it's purely descriptive. And that's what he calls it, descriptive. I look at, uh, uh, at this, may I? I look at this uh, small booklet, beautifully done, by the way. Uh, and if I'm going to define it, I do not put a program associated with it. I do not say this is a good book or this is a bad book. I simply tell you what are its makeup, right? What are, because there's more than one thing in here, right? What are. So I'm sitting here and saying, okay, well, I have pages made of a specific type of paper printed with some type of ink. It has photographs. A photograph is this, right? It has words. Words are this, et cetera, et cetera. It has staples. It's being held together. And it has a front and a back cover. That's a descriptive definition. That's the second type of definition. But the third type of definition is the one we all take for granted, use consistently, and don't really critically analyze. And that's the programmatic definition. Because every society that one steps into uh, relative to teaching, learning, and knowing is going to want to have its teaching core, the stewards of education, to replicate what they believe are the principles necessary for the children of that society to grow up to be citizens of that particular community, country, or society. And so the cultural aspects, the cultural aspects of a society develop its spiritual life. So the difference between religion and spirituality is that religion, okay, is a governmental structure, if you will. It's going to have a pope in the Catholic Church, or it's going to have, you know, a primus in the Orthodox Church, or whatever, and it's going to have a series of men that are go or women and that or both that are going to set, uh, you know, methods of uh, worship, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and, and you have to follow the rules and regulations of that particular sect in order to be able to call yourself by that name, whether it's, you know, a Muslim, a Christian, a Catholic, or an Orthodox Greek, or whatever. But spirituality, that exists without that. You, you don't need to have a religious construct that's governmental in its structure to be a spiritual person. Because every one of those things that I just mentioned, which is in the news right now, right? Whether you're in Texas deciding whether or not to use a biology book one way or another, or you're in the Middle East uh, you know, deciding that a cartoon is good enough to go assassinate some people, regardless of those two perspectives, there's one thing for sure that all those people have to share in common, and that is the fact that their spiritual point of view focuses the majority of times on one entity, one deity, if you will, right? Regardless of who they are, they believe in a deity, hmm? a deus. That's Latin for God, but I better get back to Greek, theos, okay? So what we have to understand is that you can be a spiritual person. You can believe in God if you want to call God that deity, but you don't necessarily have to be a member of a religious sect to be spiritual. Now that's important because for the Greeks, up until a certain time in their history, 
It was okay. It was okay to be spiritual. And then something happened. And it was no longer just right to be spiritual. Now, it was treason if you did not believe in the gods of the state. Best example of this you all know. If you've had any philosophy or history of uh, intellectual history, you know that in the Western perspective, when Socrates was asked to commit suicide, the charge that Miletus raised against him was treason. And when you take a look at what treason was for them, at that point, it was what? Corruption of the youth, right? Through teaching of critical thinking and, at the same time, corruption of the youth by making the statement that he had his own demiurgus, his own personal god. And that that, that god, that theos, okay, was, and this is interesting, see, see, if you, see, see how interesting this becomes, invisible, okay, omnipotent, all-powerful, and omniscient, all-knowing. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Very familiar. Now you begin to see the connection, why I spoke about religiosity and about uh, uh, spiritualism at the beginning of this talk before we got into education, because for many, many years in America, as I looked at the history of education in the United States, post-1776, in inclusive of post-1776, God was in the classroom. He lived in the classroom. When I first got to the United States in the 60s, early 60s, the first things we did when we went into a classroom before we started learning curriculum and we started learning technique and we started learning methodology relative to the curriculum, skill sets, right? Is we did two things. We pledged allegiance to the flag and God's word name was stuck in there too, by the way. And then the next thing that we did, believe it or not, is we did the Our Father. Why? Because every one of the Christian faiths that came out of the nine brothers did the Our Father. And that became part of the ethical development of the student body. This is important because what Dr. Yeager talks about in here is how did that ethical development from the ancient Greek world that originally became spiritual and later became religious, okay, affect the development of what they as a community thought should be a true citizen of the nation, of the polis, as they called it, the city-state. You know, how? How was education to do that? Well, let's talk about that in a second. Let, let, let's see who this man was, okay? Let's see who this man was. Werner Jaeger, uh, a Deutsches Mann, a, a, a German man, German professor, uh, was um, a, this is him here, was a, a, a student of philology, philosophy, history, intellectual history, uh, in Germany, studied at the University of Berlin, Humboldt University in Berlin, uh, married twice, uh, second wife uh, was of Jewish, uh, a Jewish woman, and during the time that he was generating his basic ideas that you see in these three books I passed around, Hitler comes, or begins his push, okay, his, his movement into power. So Dr. Jaeger and his new wife migrate to the United States and land at the places where this type of thinking and this type of uh, education uh, is uh, considered part of the, uh, of the core of the educational system, regardless of what major you were in. We have that here at Eastern, don't we? All, don't, don't all you students have to do general education requirements before you step into a major? Well, that came, by the way, just out of fun and giggles for you to know, out of Cornell University in New York. Uh, when a gentleman there decided that the elective system was going to be the rule of the day. And at one point or another, the elective system at Cornell University had a catalog for the semester that was 700 pages long. Of course, they, they got that out of their system and made it a normal, uh, a, a, a normal size <laughs> electives and brought back in some more of their original general education requirements. But before that, there were some schools in which that was, that was what led and maintained itself as the core of what we call a liberal arts education. And that core comes from what we call the seven liberal arts. 
And that came from the Middle Ages, which drifted to us from the Greeks. And what came to us was something called the trivium and the quadrivium. And when you take the trivium, this is Latin for, what do you think? Three. And the quadrivium, what do you think? Four. And you put them together, what do you got? That's basic yeah, arithmetic. So the trivium and the quadrivium unite together to form the seven liberal arts. Those seven liberal arts are the core of the general education requirements that you have to take during your first two years. But you can go to colleges right now where that's all that you're going to do for four years. Okay? A long time ago, and in foreign countries specifically, okay, and in private universities, some still active, as I say, this is what is done. And there's only one degree, a BA. That's it. After that, you, you wanted to go do a master's degree. You could either go there if they offered it, or you go to another university. So what we have at Eastern is a combination of what happened post-1776 and a lot of what happened to what existed before 1776 with a switch. And the switch is based on what the Greeks thought should have been done all along, which is that the ethic of a human being, uh, let's define the term, for us, an ethics is an action-based system okay, that someone does for the sake of attaining a good end. And that good end, if you're going to be a teacher, better be moral, right? Because the last thing that you want to do is teach a kid to be immoral or amoral in the classroom, correct? That, that would just be ludicrous, and we're not, uh, we're, not, we're not with the Hitler Jungen back in the 1920s and 30s or with uh, Mussolini's black shirts or with uh, uh, Paul Pock's uh, Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. We are, or with Stalin and the pioneers. Those people were teaching for amoral purposes, which meant what? that you didn't know, that you were innocently ignorant of making a mistake and thought you were doing right when wrong. So what is right from wrong is what the Greeks started to formulate, and they wanted to generate it in a way that could be used by all the city-states based on what their community thought would be the best, the best that a human being could have from an educational system. They called that perfection arete, arete, A-R-E-T-E. And it's the goal of Greek spiritual, cultural education. So now spirit doesn't just mean, you know, I'm going to go to church on Sunday, right? We understand spirit now as a driving force behind being good. And goodness to these people, okay, was being a responsible citizen of the polis, of the city-state that they lived in. Depending on what the laws of that city-state said, the education followed. You're all going to wind up in one of the 800 plus districts, right, if you're going to be a teacher in the state of Illinois, or maybe you'll step outside of it. I'm telling you right now, you are going to be representing the wishes of that community relative to educating the children of that community within your classroom. That is the fact, and that is what we call the common hierophany, the common higher level language of understanding associated with the spirit of the culture of the place that you're at in connection with what the ancient Greeks had. It, it, Dr. Wabi, it, it, it's a, a term that was generated by Dr. Mircea Eliade at the University of Chicago when he taught me the history of religions, hieros, hieros, and it's coming right out of Egypt because it's hieroglyphicos, right? So we're talking about the higher level language. But notice, we're not talking about a religious construct but about a spiritual drive. You must have a passion for your spiritual drive or you would not have chosen education as a career because I guarantee you that what you're going to be making isn't money. What you're going to be making is a difference. You're going to be making is a difference. And that difference is what drives you and elevates you above someone who's just simply looking for revenue as a method of saying, this is why I went to school. That's what separates you. That's why you get a license, not just a degree. That's why you're a professional. Understand that it's a higher way of speaking, and you have a higher responsibility. Jaeger discusses this in many things. In 1936, uh, what, 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 let's back up. When he comes to America, he comes to America, and he lands in one of the three places where the focal point is liberal education as a cultural development to generate within you both critical thinking concepts as well as the responsibility of understanding what it means to be a responsible citizen of a nation. First place he lands is the University of Chicago. He goes to Berkeley for a little while in California, 
another place where if you go, you're going to notice a lot of what I'm saying is still in existence. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Dean Irwin can attest to that if you talk to her. That's where she went, uh, uh, Dean Bonnie Irwin. Uh, and then after about six years at the University of Chicago, he goes to Harvard and stays there until his death in, I think, 1961, if I'm not wrong. But during the time that he's at Chicago giving the Gifford Lectures, which is a series of lectures that endowed by a gentleman back in the 1800s in the United States who wanted to have an association between religion, culture, and education produced forward in a uh, funded system every year, he's chosen to do this particular lecture, The Theology of Early Greek Philosophers. Very interesting. It's online. If you want to, I'll give you the URL and you can read it. But I wanted more than anything else for you to see him. Because one of the things that's really bizarre about this man is that he has a critical thinking mind, which we're going to define, and we're going to give you, we're going to give you something to walk out of here with that you can say, I know how to critically analyze something now without a negative uh, word being attached to it. Because isn't it true that whenever you hear the word critical, the first thing you think is, oh, no, not me. Don't, don't be, don't, I, I don't want critical, please. The word no, I don't want it near me, right? The Greeks didn't consider it that way. We cannot look at the ancient world with modern eyes. You have to put on their eyes to understand what they meant so that you can then see whether something from their world can be used in ours because they're two different points of views, Okay. Let me show you what I mean by a strange paradox. Here's this man, marries a Jewish woman, he's living in Germany, Hitler comes to power, and he does two of the strangest things you can imagine as a paradox. The first thing he does is he supports Hitler, and the second thing he does is he directs his Jewish wife across to the United States because he doesn't want her to die. Now don't think this is the only guy that ever did this coming out of Germany. If we had any philosophers aside in the class, I don't know if you're here. If you are, you know that Martin Heidegger also did the same thing, only he didn't leave Germany. Yet to this day, if you talk about ontology or the study of the self, the study of what it means to be authentic and existential, authenticity means making your own choices and not having other people make them for you. That man, aside from his political perspective, wrote material which did not include political perspective in it, which is powerful. It is so powerful that if you go talk to Gary Aylesworth in the philosophy department, he'll tell you he wrote a whole book on it and it's published at Indiana University. It is a very powerful statement, but it's a paradox. And in Greece, in ancient Greece, paradox is taught. Paradox has taught us how to think creatively because it gave the person in their mind two words. Two words, it caused a doubt. And the two words that caused the doubt were, wait a minute, what if? What if this was to happen instead of that? That, that's the spark of Western thinking, the spark that drives the cultural development of a human being. I found it interesting because I can't figure out the what if associated with why he did what he did why he supported them, and at the same time, he marries someone who they are deadly in hate of and takes her away from there because he loves her and brings her to a new world for no other purpose, right? For no other purpose than to be able to save her life because he was supporting their estate. He's supporting their political perspective. He could have easily stayed in Germany and been just fine himself, but no, he, he moved here for, for, for the sake of a different reason. So that pretty well gives you an idea of his biography and what he did. He wrote approximately 20 books in his life and finished as a full tenured professor at Harvard University before he died in the early 1960s. One of the things that we have to learn to do when it comes to trying to understand Paideia is that the focal point of the ideals of Greek culture as education are based on literature, on literature. In other words, you got to read. You got to read and you have to know what it is to do when you're reading so that when you come back, you can do the second part, which is logos. We, we defined it, remember? 
discursive participation in language. in language so that our conversation can clarify any misunderstandings that we might have and base the decision on what the definition truly is on evidence instead of opinion piled upon opinion piled upon opinion because I'm telling you that you can and I know that you know Dean Lanham will agree with me you can walk up and down many libraries and you start selectively pulling out tomes books and I guarantee you that he could pull out a whole series of books that are nothing more than opinion based upon opinion based upon opinion and then he could go over here and he could set a whole bunch of books that are based upon scientific or historically accurate evidence associated with a concept and I always tell my students I want the primary source I want the scientific evidence I want to see reality so that I can make a decision on its veracity on whether it is just opinion or truth because opinion you know everybody has one right but the truth the truth is something that you must make a decision upon without other people telling you what to do with it freedom is what that's called and that's one of the things that the uh, cultural education of the ancient Greek world brings across through the liberal arts to us in America so one of the things that we do is we take a look at another Greek word and that's hermeneutic hermeneutic method uh, I uh, all my philosophical studies with the exception of two classes were done at the University of Chicago and you did not go through the process there without understanding hermeneutics it just was not going to happen and hermeneutics is nothing more than a fancy word for the interpretation of a text and that means not just a book this is a text right a song is a text a poem is a text a film is a text how do you interpret that to find truth in it because the ultimate goal of arete is perfection of the member of the polis you cannot be as close to perfection as possible and be a member of the society if you don't know the truth or can prove that what you know is the truth and so hermeneutics is an interpretation an interpretation a method of interpretation why it comes uh, if we if we do the etymology that's the study of where the word came from the first thing we notice is it, we divide that in half herme herme okay hermes is the greek word for mercury and if you don't know your mythology who was the messenger of the gods mercury do you know why who knows why mercury was the messenger of the gods any ideas why hermes was the messenger of the gods the gods couldn't speak human could they huh why because the gods couldn't speak human talk the gods envied humanity the gods envied humanity because the gods would live perpetually and their beloved would die and the suffering of eternal misery relative to that was something that they could not stand so what did the gods do continuously they came down to earth to make love to humanity why because they wanted to start to eliminate immortality from their soul now that's what I mean by looking at the world with a different perspective because to us that's backwards isn't it to us immortality is the goal right even the up-to-date latest movies and television shows about vampires and immortality are driving both from a negative and even from in certain cases a positive perspective that immortality is the most important thing right the attainment of such can get us to you know paradise in one religion heaven and the other but these people instead of making their spiritual religious connection zoomorphic like the ancient Egyptians made it anthropomorphic and what does that mean it's another Greek word anthropos means man anybody here take anthropology anthropos means man logi which is what you call it in English is logos and we know what logos is right discursive practices to make sure that we have knowledge about something that's truthful so that means discursive practices that we have knowledge about something that's truthful we have evidence to associated with the study of man if I say sociology now you understand that that's about what men in groups right or men women humanity in groups and the study of that right so everything that says LLGY right is going to be associated with Greek cultural educational perspectives look up and down your catalog and every time you see LOGY associated with it I'm telling you 
you're connecting yourself to a Greek educational concept. But let's look at a method. This is a simple one, semantic cognitive analysis. Big fancy words. Semantic, talking, cognition, thinking, and analysis. Taking things apart, seeing how they work, and then putting them back together to get an understanding of the whole instead of just of the pieces. Let's look at some acronyms associated with it. Two of them, HOT and LOT. HOT, higher order thinking. LOT, lower order thinking. Okay? What is LOT? LOT's a Google search. Why is it a Google search? Well, because all that it means is who, what, where, when. You with me so far? I can go to Google and I can type in, you know, Jackson Brown, okay? And I hit that button and I'm going to get back who, what, where, and when. But you know what I'm not going to get back? I'm not going to get back how and why. And if I do get it back, I want to be able to make sure that the how and why is evidence-based and not the opinion just of other subject matter experts who have become subject matter experts by publishing a lot of books because they could have published them without evidence. You understand? What we're looking for? The truth. The truth. Whether it hurts or not. That's what the Greeks wanted. The spirit of perfection in approximating to the truth in action is the ethic, is the method that they used in ethos, in thinking, and in pathos, in physical action. That's what arete, relative to education, to paideia, for the Greeks, was about. And we have to be able to see that filter, because if, as it filters to us now, it filters through us through critical thinking. Without that, you're not connecting to the Greeks. Now, notice I said at the beginning of this small lecture, there was a time when the Greeks shifted. They were no longer allowing you to have the freedom to be authentic. Now the gods of the state decided whether you were guilty of corrupting the youth or of being treasonable. Ergo, Socrates is asked to drink hemlock. So there was a time when things shifted. Yet time went by further. And those people who fought against that theocratic or godlike religious structure of restriction came through and went to different countries thanks to one guy, a young man who conquers the world before he's 30 years old, Alexandro Magnus, okay? Alexander the Great, who does a Hellenization of the world and brings these methodologies that we're discussing in simple terms. Because, you know, I, I can tell you these things in their original formation. I can give you all the fancy Greek terms. That's not what we're here for. We're here to understand how it is that the spirit of our nation, let's say, is akin in some way to the spirit of the founding Greek thought processes through critical thinking. And that came to us after 1776. In other words, what Greece did was they thought first freedom, then they went and became religious. And what we did is we started first with religious, and then we started thinking about freedom. And that freedom after 1776 filtered into the schools. But they said, you know, there, there's not too many. There's a, there are some good things the Greeks had at both times. Let's grab them and bring them in. Let's grab them and bring them in. What were they? It was their literature. It's how they taught. The educational philosophy that's associated with this is called perennialism. Okay? like a flower that constantly keeps coming back every year. Why? Because through it, they were able to find both the differences associated with the stipulative time that was happening in action, and by eliminating the differences, get to the core of what could be used to understand what was occurring in their time versus the time in the past. But what was the trick? I could not put my modern eyes on the ancient world until I cleansed it enough to be able to see the modern problem with my modern eyes and the ancient problem with the ancient modern eyes. So how did I do that? Well, I had to find certain keys that would allow me to interpret, you to interpret what it was like back then, right? Can anybody guess what those keys would be like? What they would be? I gave you one. Didn't I say to you not too long ago that there was a time and always will be a time when some kind of religious concept is going to be ever-present in our society? Hmm? Of course. I told you what happened in the Arbella, right? I told you the shift. 
I told you that there was a shift in the other direction in Greece, right? And a shift in the other direction in the United States. But still, what was constant? The shift. And what was constant about the shift? Hmm? There was a key that allowed me to understand it. And that was that they had a religious concept which they believed would give them a spiritual understanding of the conditions needed in order to be a true, good, true and good citizen of the state. True? How? Follow the laws. What laws? The laws of the state. What did that make them? Good. In whose eyes? Theirs. And like you, when you step into your communities to teach, you cannot forget that that's what you're there to do. And I've said it three times because I need to nail that down three times. It's important that you understand that. So this is a simple thing. I look at anything that I read or anything that I watch and I do this to it. And I try to find within it the key that answers the door, the key that opens it. Why? Because it could be economics, and it always existed. It could be politics, and it always existed. It could be governmental structures. They always existed. Religions always existed, right? Those are perennial windows of interpretation that I need to have an understanding of relative to what's in that literature that they are using in order to develop that citizen of that state. And that allows me to see what eyes they were looking at or they were looking with at education. You follow? Thank you. Let's do it now. So the, the main thing for lower order questions is what, who, where, and when. Right? So if I let you ask me those questions, okay, which I hope you will, we'll be able to start logos between us about paideia as soon as possible. So don't forget them, because I'll be your Google. I won't have Google's money, but I'll be your Google. And the next questions are hot, higher order thinking questions. How and why? I can't answer them for you. Because if I answered them for you and said, oh, yeah, Dr. Albert, that's fine. That's the, yeah, yeah, we believe you. You know, you're the big guy standing up there talking. What have you just done? What have you just done? You've accepted opinion without evidence. But if I give you evidence and you prove that evidence, historical or not, to be true, and you then decide yourself to accept it, you have done the one thing that the Greek cultural concept of idea wants you to be and do, and that is authenticity. You have been authentic in your action. You have made a decision based on what you think is good relative to what I am putting in front of you, and you've checked what I've set out to make sure that what I'm giving you is not just an evangelical perspective that's trying to convince you to come to my side. And this is so important, especially uh, within the next month. This is extremely important because what happens to us in America is that we start to confuse two things. You see, arete is a perfection that later on becomes a goal, and the goal that they seek for is a goal that's an end and not a means to an end, and that goal is happiness. You can't buy it. I can't go get some happiness and trade you for it, right? It's an end. That's an individual end. How I attain it makes me authentic, okay? It might make me uh, someone that the state might not like, but I was authentic to myself with it. But my problem is that, and your problem is, that the majority of the students that you're going to have coming into your classrooms are going to have a strong confusion. You know what that is? They think pleasure is happiness. And think about what we've done. We've behaviorally modified them since B.F. Skinner and, and all the way back to Pavlov into salivating about getting a letter grade or a star or a number or something relative to how quantifiably they can be called qualitative people. And that, that, that's not true. You cannot have just a number telling you that you are worth something. Because if that was the case, then what I said before was a lie, and I don't lie to you about education. Believe me, I went through it. I know that you will make a difference, but you will not make a million dollars. Unless you write a book and become famous and, you know, do something like that relative to education, which has been done, has been done. It really has. I, I know members of our faculty that have done that, okay, very successfully. 
and they're still very true to, to their belief system in making a difference. So that's not impossible. But just remember, it's the exception to the rule, not the rule. So that being said and done, look at what it says inside this little book that I'm supposed to be doing. Because I'm going to sit down. Because you see, the first lesson I learned is, is there's an antithetical relationship between what someone does when they're standing up and when everybody's sitting down. And this is supposed to be a symposium, okay? Not supposed to be an industrial-based system in which the boss is standing above you looking down through the window telling you, hey, you missed that one, or hey, you're not here on time, or hey, hey what's going on? I'm not getting the same quality as before. What, are you taking too many cigarette breaks or something? Well, that's, an, that, that's a contrary position, see? Uh, you're going to be supposed to be standing like this in front of the classroom. Everybody else is going to be sitting down, and what you've got to do is this. Because you've got to let them see that you're not just somebody who's guiding them, which is what you're supposed to be doing through the curriculum and skills that are necessary to be cultured within what this society says culture is as a member of this polis known as the United States, but you're supposed to be one of them. Aren't we the people? I thought we were, weren't we? So we the people means i got to sit down. Because from this perspective, we talk, and I don't dictate. And that's what's important about education. You must put yourself in the position that once you were in, empathetically, you must put yourself in the position of being a guide and not just being a leader. And when you guide, you learn. So when you take a look at what's uh, been written here that I'm supposed to be doing, let's see, let me see. Who can help me? What page am I on? 16. 16. Okay, hold on. Oh, look at Bob's there, too. It says, I'll be reintroducing into our educational discourses the concepts that are inherent or that are originally part of the cultural, philosophical, and historical education that we, as Americans, uh, that's the supposition of we, the people, right, um, derived from the ancient Greeks. That's one statement. So what... Can you tell me one thing that I spoke to you about that we derived from the ancient Greeks? Anybody? It's a symposium. You're supposed to talk, okay? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Somebody else, please. Okay, watch, watch, watch. I'm going to prove my point. I'm going to prove my point. I'll give you a candy bar if you answer. <laughs> no? That didn't work? Okay, over here. Okay, good. So we have two things right there. Critical thinking methodologies, analysis, interpretation based on principles that are truthful instead of just opinions of others. Because, you know, we can look real pretty, we can look real nice, we can look real strong, real handsome, we could look like we know what we're talking about and not have one ounce of evidence except our looks put us in a position of authority, right? Uh, if you want to see evidence, hardcore evidence to that, um, I think you might have it in the library. Uh, the Nixon-Kennedy debates back in the 60s, take a look at them and watch the faces of John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon, regardless of what Nixon did later, and analyze purely, listen closely to the answers that Nixon gives and that Kennedy gives, and you will know immediately, if you turn off the TV and just listen to it, that Nixon was right, that Nixon was right, and that what Kennedy was doing was learning how not to sweat, okay? learning how not to sweat and look like he was the next king of Camelot, bringing along with him his Guinevere, okay, who was being supported even by clothing companies known as Chanel, all right? So we have some ideas, right, of what it is that we got. But, but, but one of the main ones, right, is, is what? What, what, is this, what are we supposed to be helping the student become? Hmm? A citoyen, a citizen, yeah? Of what? Because this is the question. We are a United States where we are the people. So the question becomes, are we educating, are we guiding? Because, you know, you don't educate, listen, listen. You don't educate anybody, okay? You don't. People educate themselves. You guide them 
through curriculum and skill sets to self-awareness and understanding of truth and falsity. That's what you do. And in the process of doing that, through example and through discourse, you help them come to a realization of what their ethic is, what their action-based system is that's necessary for them to attain what they are going to call arete, or a good moral end. Now, later on, when the Greeks continue thinking about this, the ultimate moral end to them is happiness, that's Aristotle, and later on even further, the ultimate moral end for all Greeks is the development of a beautiful life through an ethic that allows them to be authentic. And that comes from even before them through a guy called Heraclitus, a pre-Socratic philosopher, and Parmenides, another pre-Socratic philosopher, that influences the one guy that they hated the most and forced to die, named Socrates. Okay, why? Now, many of you have been in my class, right? And I've put you through, right, a psychodrama, haven't I? Was that a good experience? It made you see things a little different, didn't it? The psychodrama is one of the techniques that the Greeks devised, uh, specifically through Socrates, as brought to us through three sources, Xenophon, Aristophanes, and uh, Plato, as to how it is that Socrates taught. How did Socrates teach? By shocking the daylights out of people by making the power brokers hate the daylights out of him because he did that in front of their children and so they decided to write up right an indictment against him relative to what laws of the state which they grasped onto and said ah see we can use this to get rid of this guy you're never going to be able to do an action that defines who you are and this is what i mean by that if I give you a baseball bat and I say to you, what is this? And you've never seen a baseball bat in your life nor know what baseball is. And there's people throughout the world that tru truly understand this, okay? Don't have any idea what that is. The best thing that you could do is give me one of the three definitional constructs that I gave you, which is a descriptive one, right? What would you say? Baseball bats are made of? Sometimes they're made of metal. What else could you tell me descriptively as a definitional construct? Weight. Length, size, right, cylinder. But if you've never seen a baseball game, could you tell me what it means to be a bat? Could you tell me batness? Could you tell me what a bat does? Anybody? No. So in order for you to truly understand what something is, you got to see it in action, don't you? At that point, you really know what that thing is for, that phenomena or that noumena. Noumena just means thinking. You can thank Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason for that one. Okay? He gave thinking a different name so that he could compare and contrast it with phenomena, which is physical reality that I can touch and feel. But only by knowing how something works will you truly understand what something is. Because then you have something that you can use empirically to prove that it is true or false, right? Because if it's not doing what the bat is supposed to do, okay, it's not a bat. Or it's not a good bat. Hmm? Because if I put a bat made of, um, oh, I don't know, pasta in the hands of uh, Mark Teixeira, Yes, I'm a Yankee fan. And I put him in the home plate, swinging at a slow pitch. And he winds up that golf swing of his, and he wants to pepper that thing out of the world. What's going to happen to that bat the moment it hits that ball? And what's going to happen to the ball? Right? That's evidence that that is not a bat. You follow? So when you teach, whether it's skill set and content or method of being, so that the child and the student can be authentic and you're bringing the child to your curriculum as a guide, remember, you've got to give them the freedom to learn how to be authentic. 
Because if you don't, you're doing nothing more than building a replacement fart for a retiree or for an obituary. You're not constructing anything new. You're not helping someone to become truly authentic and generate something new that will add value to the society. You will simply be doing nothing more than perpetuating, maintaining the status quo. This is the last thing I'll tell you that I got from the Greeks, especially from reading these three volumes. Because I'm not going to sit here and tell you, well, you know, Aeschylus said this, and Euripides said that, and Homer said this, and, you know, that, that's for you to do. That's for you to read and ask your teachers. What I'm giving you is the reason why it's important to read and read critically. But as a teacher, and most of you here, I, I, I'm assuming, are going to be teachers or are teachers, but the ones that are going to be, because I'm not going to be assumptive enough to try to tell uh, others that are already in the field what to do, but I'll tell you what I do, okay? Because I try to put my, my I, I want to put my teaching mode through five simple processes, and I call them the five T's. I learned this by reading these books, the five T's. I'll read I'll, I'll say them to you, okay? And then I'll tell you what they are. Transmit, transform, transcend, transfer, and transfigure. I'll give you a simple understanding of them. I gotta stand up a little big, get my hip back in place. When you transmit information as a teacher, like this man did through these books and that little thing I put up there in my discourse today, if I simply stand here and not get you to talk to me and answer, even if I have to pull teeth with no Novocaine to get an answer out of you, by the fact that I got you involved in answering and thinking, okay, if the first time it popped in your head, you said, what if this or maybe not that, the moment that I got you thinking and then I got you the courage to talk because you no longer were afraid that I might criticize you negatively, right? I started getting you to understand transmission. Notice I didn't say I transmitted anything to you. I got you to start understanding how to transmit your thought processes into something that you could do something with. Because again, as I said before, action tells us more than just simply description. Transmission is a two-way process, but it must lead from the student to you, not from you to the student. That's first. And it leads through the curriculum and through the skill sets that you guide the student to learn. That's it. That's transmission. Right? Transform. A student gets transformed from the first second, first millisecond that they entered the classroom door. And that's just basic time. By the 181st school day, most, most of the school years, right, K through 12 are 181 days long. By the time they got to a day 181, regardless of whether they didn't want to learn anything, okay, they have had some transformative action happen to them because I guarantee you that even the most recalcitrant person who doesn't want to learn anything will remember one thing at some time about your class, even if it's the fact that they can't stand you. They will. So you've transformed a thought in one way or another just by the fact that they've come into your class and you've started doing curriculum and skill set and ethic. Transcend. That means that if they actually became involved in educating themselves relative to the curriculum and skill set, that they've transcended their understanding from what they knew before to what they know now. Now, reality is a little different. There's something new in the ball game. It's no longer a pasta bat because that one don't work. Work? Now it has to be wood or metal. My understanding has now been transcended. See? I know something different about reality than I knew before. Transmit, transform, transcend. Now that I've got that information, you know what's really cool? Now comes, this is the hottest word I ever heard in education. Hot because it's been used so many times in education, it just is unbelievable. It's called transfer. Transfer is being able to take something from music, hmm? like, you know, what are, what's an eighth beat, what's a quarter beat, whatever, and being able to use that to understand a little bit about fractions in math class. Tra transfer is going into art class and having somebody show me perspective drawing and then being able to see 
C, actually, when I go back into geometry class, a three-dimensional perspective that I could not see before. And transfer is important because it initiates the interdisciplinary process. But without critical thinking, you can be fooled and try to transfer something into something else, and I guarantee you, it won't work. That's why we have to thank the Greeks for how they taught, because they taught how to think authentic. Transmit, transform, transcend, transfer. And the last one, transfigure. And this is the most important one of them all, because nothing in here was written in these three books without that concept in mind. And transfiguration, by definition, okay, is the changing. It's changing beyond. Not just the self. That would be metamorphosis, okay? Changing into something else. No, no, no. Transfiguring something. Making it better. Making something new. Doing something that wasn't done before. Hmm? For the sake of, if we follow the Greek mind, others. Why others? Well, who makes up the society? You? Just you? Okay, show me your cave. You're a hermit. Right? So if the society is made up of all of us, then this room right now, we have a society. Huh? Correct? If one of us transfigures something for the sake of all of us, guess what we will have attained? Pleasure, because everybody will say, congratulations. Happiness, because we've confused pleasure with happiness, but it, we're on our way to happiness. And then true happiness, when what we do allows us to feel euphoria, okay? Or as in mathematics, as they would say, eureka, right? The internal joy of self-discovery without the assistance of the guiding teacher. You've hit the mark. You've got a student now for life who knows how to work and study and learn and develop for others with you no longer being the guide in the classroom that got them to begin their educative process. And so this evolution of the psyche, by the way, that's another Greek term, the mind, the personality, the essence of the being, which in certain cases, because they really didn't understand biology, that word, uh, back in their days, at uh, one time they actually thought it was in the liver. Do you know why they thought it was in the liver? Do you ever hear something called the auguries? The auguries is, boy, let's go back to Greece. Here's Athens. Here's Sparta, right? Everybody's seen 300, right? First thing you got to remember is Spartans never wore Speedos, okay? <laughs> never wore Speedos. Second thing is they never went bare-chested. They were known as the men of the brass plate because they, sh they polished them so that when they went to war, everybody could see them coming. They wore red cloaks to cover themselves so that when they were wounded, the enemy couldn't see their blood, okay? And they also led their entire army with a band so that they could be heard coming a mile away. Now, I just wanted you to know that because, you know, 300 is a little bit, mm, it has some historical problems, and I just... I don't want you to swallow that red pill until you see the blue one in the other guy's hand. That's the matrix. You know? <laughs> but the, the, the important thing is that what Dr. Yeager writes about here is how the literature of the ancient Greek world, through its <laughs> methods, not just through its words, but through its methods, through its goals and objectives associated with each of the individual authors that he talks about in here, can help us become authentic, critical thinkers that cannot, cannot, if we truly use the methodologies that are being discussed by the different authors in here throughout the time period, simply accept opinion as fact. Because once you become attuned to the fact that truth is the most important driving force towards happiness, everything else is just a drug to make you feel numb about uh, life. And if you want to accept that, you're not an American. Because that's what the revolution was about. Not accepting what others had to say about you without you making your own decision. But it's not just Americans. 
a citizen of the world, a member of the only race that matters, the human race, has to be able to think in this fashion and analyze what things are put in front of them without fear of retribution because the only person that you should fear is yourself on the last day of your life when you're about to take your last breath so that you no longer have to say ever, 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 shoulda, coulda, would have. Everything, everything associated with what you learn, what you teach, what you know, is basically guiding you to the moment of not regretting the existence you had on earth by the fact that that regret doesn't exist because you transfigured in some way, in one little way, in one minute way, in one way or another, someone's life or made something more beautiful. If you did that, you'll have no regrets. That's what Paideia, as an ideal of the culture of education in that world, was driving for. So when you read your books and, you know, your history books and your philosophy books and your, your books about this and that and mathematics and everything, remember, it isn't just about memorizing for the quiz, memorizing for the test, getting the number and getting it done. It's about what can I do with this that makes life better for others that'll make me feel pleasure for doing it on my way to understanding happiness. Because that's the goal. That's the goal. Making a difference. So, I highly suggest if you want to read these books, the translator of Dr. Yeager's work was uh, Dr. Gilbert Heigett. Dr. Gilbert Heigett wrote a book called The Art of Teaching. And the art of teaching is something that I always tell my students. Do not, do not, do not become a teacher or bypass the chance before you step into the classroom of reading Gilbert Heigett's The Art of Teaching. Because you see, education isn't just a science. If you really want to know what education is all about, is taking the science of assuredness associated with quantification and quality and making it an art form that everyone looks at through your actions in relationship with others and says, gosh, isn't that beautiful? That's what Paideia taught me. So I hope you enjoy it, and I hope that you look at them and that you find them. Uh, you can YouTube him. He's got a bunch of stuff out there. Uh, his biography is out there in both German and English. Uh, and, and the books are available. I know Paideia, I know all three volumes are here in our library. And so is uh, Gilbert Heigett's The Art of Teaching. Don't bypass that one because that's, that's an important thing. And whenever I come here, I've come here before to give lectures at the library, I always bring books and Dr. Lanham always says to me, you're bringing books to the library, hey, hooray. And I said, yes, because this is an important part of our culture and it's something that we inherited from them. They started doing everything by memorization and oral tradition. And then they went to this, because this is an important part of the tradition of learning. I remember one time uh, Dr. Lanham came into uh, Dr. Wabi's class to give a lecture on uh, libraries and technology. And one of the most shocking things I ever heard, okay, which opened my eyes like that, was that I, asked, I said, why can't we put this in electronic form available so that we can shoot it through the uh, ethereal world and have them in their little, um, what do they call them, um, iPads and all that, be able to just have them there, and then, you know, we can, we can, we, we can technologize education in this way, and, and, and we can use this for other methods of, you know, maintaining information and expansion. And he told me flat out, he, and I'll never forget this, he says, this is not just part of the culture. This is cost effective. And I had it backwards. I thought the electronic medium would be cost effective. But the truth of the matter is, it's not, is it, Dr. Lanham? It costs almost 10 times as much to, to have it in an electronic medium as it does to have it this way. But this particular thing, this thing I'm holding in my hand, you know what's important about it? If it's true, if it's been proven true, if it tells the truth, 
It can never be changed. It can never be changed. Because to change it would be to turn the truth into a lie. You understand? Okay. Thank you for coming today. Oh, I got a microphone here. You want this one? Okay. I'm going to sit down to answer. Okay? Well, thank you very much, no Dr. Albert, and thank you all for staying. And I know it is time to eat now, but we all had right. food for thought, I think. <laughs> uh, we have a minute or two for a question or two. So anybody wants to have a question for Dr. Albert, that's your time. If you don't have, I'll volunteer him to receive your emails after sure. a while. And uh, if uh, you like email me, I email him or email him directly. It will be a dialogue mm -hmm. that's wonderful. We always have fun with so dialogue. So please uh, do that. And uh, mm -hmm. there is appreciation. Oh. Uh, and I would like to uh, present you with uh, one of the commemorative oh, thank you very much. certificates uh, mm -hmm. for the symposium. Mm -hmm. And thank you very much for no, thank you. Uh, very, very interesting and very challenging lecture. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Very good. And thank you all for Just remember, if you ask me a question, remember that the only, the only rule is this. A good question is more important than a mediocre answer. So I will always, always answer a good question. But I'm not going to promise you anything but an attempt at not being mediocre, okay? Yeah. Thank you. All.